Hey, everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, and it's a real honor and a privilege to uh, have my guest with me today. We're with Rick Emmett, of course, from Triumph, and he's had a very long, robust solo career after that, or as he's known in Canada as Rick Rocket Emmett. A couple of quick announcements. Make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to uh, subscribe to the show on audio and video, and also Carlos Santana, Joe Walsh. If you can connect me with them, please do. I love those guys on my show. Let me give you a real quick background of Rick. I would imagine 90% of people listening to this already know Rick, but just in case, uh, he's got a, he's a, let me tell you, first of all, before I just get, he's an incredibly nice guy. He's very kind person, man. I mean, he's just a sweetheart of a guy and he's, he's just, he's fighting a good fight every day. Like they're all of us, man. All right. Rick Emmett relative. He was a relatively unknown singer, songwriter, guitarist on the local Toronto scene in September of 75 joined a newly formed hard rock trio called triumph, which of course was Rick on lead guitar and vocals, Mike Levine on bass and keys and Gilmore on drums and vocals. By 79, four years later, three Triumph albums had gone platinum in Canada, two charted here in the States. By 81, Triumph was firmly established as one of the premier touring rock acts in North America. They had generous FM radio airplay support and heavy rotation on MTV. Over the next seven years, the band released 10, 10 gold albums, four turned platinum in Canada, and in the U.S., two went gold. Rick's name frequently appeared in guitar magazine polls, and he won a lot of prestigious national guitar awards. As one of Triumph's original members, he was inducted into the Canadian Rock Hall of Fame in 93, the Music Industry Hall of Fame in 2007, and the Junos Hall of Fame in 2008. Triumph reunited briefly for concerts in Sweden and Oklahoma in the summer of 2008, and they were inducted into Canadian Walk of Fame in 2019. In 1988, Rick left Triumph to pursue a solo career. Since then, he's released 20, I hope that number is accurate, studio and live albums in various solo projects. He's toured periodically. He's won a variety of awards for these records, including Duo of the Year, Album of the Year, Guitarist of the Year, and his first solo release called Absolutely Went Gold. His solo projects, his, this is a guy who's as a musician, goes way beyond Triumph. Um, And I would really encourage all the big guitar geeks out there to check out Rick's solo catalog. He's incredibly talented. Gypsy jazz, jazz, folk, acoustic, classical. I mean, he's all over the board. Uh, His solo projects, like I said, acoustic guitar, smooth jazz, world music, progressive rock and folk. Uh, In the last few years, he's toured periodically in a a duo with guitarist Dave Dunlop. And uh, he has a new album that's out now called Folk Songs for the Farewell Bonfire. And he's got a bunch of stuff that goes with it. And we'll talk about that later on. And um, if you haven't checked out his last rock record, it's called Resolution 9. There's some very good rock and roll on there, man. So um, just check out everything Rick's doing. Rick, thank you so much for your time. And I'll shut up now. Thanks for everything. <laughs> <laughs> right on <laughs> okay thanks for the interview <laughs> <laughs> i know i'm exhausted oh man how did you first get started in in the music business and like what was the first break you guys had um well i mean you know these things happen gradually you know and, and it depends on how you define the music business like if you play uh you know a public school or a high school dance and you know, you're, you're playing for the door. I suppose that's professional show yeah. business, but you know, uh, so I mean, we, I did that when I was still in high school, you know, but I mean, when I was still in high school, the big thing was I, I tore my knee up playing football when I was 17. And that was when I sort of, uh, my life changed and I went, okay, I'm going to try and get serious with the guitar. Um, so I really started doing some shedding and, and very short order. Uh, I, sort of knew some guys in my high school, got me involved in playing uh, weddings and bar mitzvahs. And, you know, so I had a suit and I got a, a telly and a little Fender amp and I started being a jobbing musician uh, and read, like reading like song charts. Not, not really, uh, I couldn't sight read, but I could follow a chart, you know, because I'd sung in church choirs and school choirs and I'd done all that in the background. So anyhow, I got my union card and I was, you know, jobbing by the time I was 18. 
and uh, you know, always had basement bands and things, and they would play shows from time to time. But uh, the first big break was uh, we auditioned a guy, a, a drummer friend of mine, and I were going to start a thing to play Holiday Inn lounges, like a a straightforward kind of a pop thing. Uh, and we were auditioning bass players, and a guy was a really long-haired dude from out in Winnipeg, and he and he said. Um, Look, you know, I don't want to join your thing and your drummer's piece of shit anyways, but he goes, huh, why don't you come to an audition that I'm doing? Because I think you're really good and I think they, they want you. And it's for this singer called Justin Page. And they've got a record deal cooking with Capitol Records in Canada. And uh, so that would have been sort of 1973, 74, somewhere around there. And uh, I got I got that audition and I was in the band. And so I toured with that for about almost a year, nine months, uh, was part of the album project. And they had... Uh, I don't, I don't know so was this after around. school or were you still in high school at the time? No, I, I, was, out of, I was out of school okay. now. And I'd already okay. done one semester in college okay. where I was studying jazz. And the teacher said, no, don't quit. And I was going, no, why should I stay here? I can see which guys are going to become, you know, the jingle the players and the guys that are the studio cats because they can read fly shit. They're amazingly great players. Yeah. You know, I'm pretty good at putting on a pair of spandex pants and wiggling my butt. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and Rick is wearing spandex pants right now to prove that point. <laughs> so, uh, there is a little stretch in these jeans. <laughs> anyhow, so I, I was way ahead of my time. Yeah. Um, anyhow, so uh, yeah, so uh, the, that record, they had a guy, I, I can't remember, Lee DiCarlo was the name of the producer, and he knew the guys that played in Alice Cooper's band, like Prakash John, the bass player, and, and Hunter and Wagner, the two guitar players there, uh, Steve Hunter, Dick Wagner, I think. I had and Steve so Hunter he, on the show here, man. He's a, he's a pretty interesting cat. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and those were pretty interesting times, right? Very the, much. The band that I was in. I want to talk to you about the Bose S1, which is an amazing speaker for acoustic guitars that I've been playing lately. The S1 has two separate channels. It has one for your guitar and then another one for a microphone. And then there's a third channel you can use for a looper or for backing tracks that you could access by Bluetooth or through a one eighth inch plug. And the S1s are also very easy to carry. It's got an easy to grab top handle and absolutely anyone can tote it around. And it's also rechargeable for up to 11 hours. The S1 was specifically designed to optimize the sound of your acoustic guitar on acoustic guitar gigs. The guitar and mic channels each have separate tone, volume, and reverb controls, and there's also a proprietary tone match switch, which restores and optimizes the natural sound of your acoustic guitar, which as you know, is typically the biggest problem with acoustic amps. Now I tested the S1 myself and the tone, volume, and reverb controls sound great and they're very responsive. You can position the S1 in four different ways. You can tilt it back so you broadcast out to an audience or you could put it horizontally, vertically, or on a stand. And the cool thing is the S1 has a Bose accelerometer so it automatically adjusts the EQ and optimizes the sound for whichever one of these four positions you're using. The S1 also happens to be the best Bluetooth speaker that Bose makes, which is pretty compelling since Bose is known for the quality of their Bluetooth speakers. So effectively, you have an acoustic guitar amp, a PA, and a killer Bluetooth speaker all in one. And the bottom line is this. If you're an acoustic guitar player, there's absolutely nothing out there that sounds this good and this big that's also easy to carry and battery powered. As far as the Bluetooth speaker goes, I've used it many times here at home for family barbecues and the sound is so good, my kids wind up arguing over who gets to play the music they want. You know, it's literally like having a full stereo system out on your patio. You can use the S1 for DJing, tailgating, or whatever you want. Before this, you'd have to spend a bunch of money on loads of different speakers and pedals to get the same thing the S1 does on on its own. On top of that, it looks great just like all Bose devices do. And besides whatever money back guarantee you get from wherever you buy the S1, Bose also warranties the S1 for two years for any kind of defects in materials or performance. For more information and to find out where to get your own S1, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash S1. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash S1. Get the S1. It's outstanding. 
Are you looking to buy or sell a home in the Tampa Bay area without having to deal with pushy realtors? Then make sure you connect with West Florida Real Estate. West Florida Real Estate has helped over 300 homeowners and investors buy and sell their properties over the last five years. Their service is outstanding, just like back in the days when there was actually service in the service business, and you'll never have to deal with any kind of sales junk when you're working with them. For more information, email Ann with an E at WestFloridaRealEstate.com. That's A-N-N-E at WestFloridaRealEstate.com. If you're enjoying this show and you'd like to support it, go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash support. And for information on advertising, visit EveryoneLovesGuitar.com forward slash advertise. Was we cross-dressed and, and wore crazy outfits and the singer was sort of a transvestite kind of character because of whole, you know, uh, Bowie and Lou Reed and all of that. Stuff. Sure. Yeah, and Alice Cooper and so the makeup and everything. So, yeah, that was that band, and they made one album, and they, he had Hunter and Wagner play on the album and stuff. Um, it went nowhere, and but I was itching and wanted to get into a progressive rock band, and set, so I did that on my own for a bit. And then uh, so, uh, the summer of 75, uh, Triumph came around and said, hey, you know, you want to, you, you know, we, we, we want you to be our guitar player. We've got this record deal thing and blah, blah, blah. And, you're the guy. And so in September of 75, I started with Triumph. And so I suppose that was the beginning. Of, but, you know, when you have the questions about breaks and, you know, sometimes breaks, you have no idea what a break is until you're looking back at it, you know, yeah. with 10 yeah. years in your pocket, you know. Yes. And then you go, yeah. huh, I made that decision back then and I had no idea that it was changing my life, you know. So um, you're so you're 100 percent self-taught. Well, yes and no. I mean, when I first started, and this is a pretty good story for guitar players, I, I, I'm, I'm what they call dextrosinistral, which means I do things of strength with my left hand, but I do fine motor control with my right. So I, I would swing wow. a, a bat left-handed. I would throw a baseball left-handed. But when I pick up a pen to write, I write with my right hand. When I pick up a fork to eat, I eat with my right hand. So it's not that unusual, but, you know, Left-handed people are only 10% of the population. So dextrosinistrality would be a very small, yeah. you know. And, and the other side of it is sinistrodextral, where some people have their, their right hand is their strong hand and their left hand is their fine motor control. Anyways, so when I, when I first picked up a guitar, I wanted to play like Paul McCartney and get my hands in the camera there. I wanted to play this way. Yeah. And I went and I won eight free lessons from a place called the Regency School of Music. <laughs> and I had a teacher, his name was Jack Arsenal. And Jack was a left-handed guy who played guitar right-handed. And he took the guitar from me and he said, no, no, you're going to play it this way. And I went, oh, no, this feels weird, like just completely weird. And he said, just trust me, all right? Give me a month, and I promise you, you will be better than all of your right-handed friends because your, your power hand is on the fretboard. And true enough, I mean, the things that people find so difficult when they're first starting, like a, an F chord where you're trying to get that little mini bar with your first finger, like – People like right-handed people struggle like crazy with that. Yeah. But it only yeah. took me about you know a few days, and I was going, oh, I got that. So it's like, I was way ahead of. And then people are going, oh, Rick, you're so good, and now you're getting positive feedback. <laughs> it's just one of those fluky things, you know. So that's, anyhow, that's that was. Great. So I had lessons from him, and then as I said, I played violin in high school for like five years. So I, did, I had, you know, some kinds of sort of formal musical education, play, sang in choirs and stuff. But uh, I went and I went to college for one semester and I studied with a guy named Peter Harris, who sort of became a mentor of mine. But um, I, t to be honest, and I don't want this to sound like too much puffery, but I, I feel like I, um, I had so much of a kind of a natural gift and natural talents yeah. that mm -hmm lessons was not my thing it was like no 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 you know i'll just learn it by ear and i'll you know and i'll wiggle my pants and spend it when you go wiggle my ass and spend it you know i'll get i'll have a career you know so yeah i was a performer i wasn't really a a schooled academic kind of player you know but where did you learn I mean, all the stuff you've done post triumph is not it's far from easy you're you got to be skilled to do that yeah where did, when did you, I mean, like that, you know, when did you pick that up that you didn't just 
fall off a no, log. I think it was it was always kind of a part of me, and I've really okay. just kept working on that. And you know, I should make this point that you know, people think about gifts or talents, and and you know, if I talk about them, it starts to sound like like you know, like I'm bragging. No, but, it doesn't. At all. It doesn't. A hundred percent. Don't worry things, about that. No, it's stuff that I had. Yeah. You know, it's, it's like, but it's also a burden. You have this thing where you have to service it. Yes. It's like if you were a tremendous athlete and then, you know, you start to play a sport and then somebody says, okay, it's good, but you are going to have to work out four hours a day and then show up for practices and you'll have to be in the batting cage for two and a half hours until blisters come every day, you know, because you're servicing this gift that you have. And right. that's one of the things that separates wheat from chaff is that, you know, um, yeah, you know, so I, it was a thing that I always, and I had to service it. So a bit of a burden but also, you know, an honor that you have this in your life, right? Yes. And I'm going to come back to this point later on, because it's something that's pretty consistent, uh, you know, through everything I've read, uh, you know, especially the stuff you sent me back, you know? Um, all right. So I hate, to, I'm going to ask you a couple of triumph questions. I know there's probably a question about triumph. There's not a question you haven't asked. So I'm going to, this is like my disclaimer apology for this part of the interview. Yeah, that's um, fine. Yeah, I just want to ask it because it's maybe somebody, you know, people listening haven't heard it. So, uh, and also, and I think, you know, this, my interest is not like gossip at all. It's just like curiosity about this. Sure. Okay. I get it. So if Wikipedia is correct, which the bar is low there. Um, <laughs> if you got a pulse, you can get on Wikipedia, or if you got a computer or connection. Uh, your first concert with Triumph was at Simcoe High School in September '75. Uh, so my first question is, what do you remember about that show? Yeah, well, um, I remember, you know, in the rehearsals <laughs> leading up to it, how we were just trying to build this. I, I think our PA system had empty boxes like just you know it looked <laughs> like speaker God. cabinets but but you know there was no speaker in it just so that the pa would look ma more massive and there was probably <laughs> light light cans park cans that had no bulbs in them uh, <laughs> but we hey. were trying to you know put on a show and so we had this really large truck and the truck got onto the grass on it was as it was backing up to the high school gym's doors and then when we finished the gig the principal didn't want to pay us these, you know, mangy rock and roll guys with their long hair that were so uppity that had brought this, you know, tractor trailer truck to their school. And it was like, why should I pay you? You wrecked our grass. And it was like, well, you signed <laughs> yeah. a contract and you have to pay us. And yeah. so there was a, a slight altercation in the, uh, in the principal's office as our drummer was getting paid. So I remember that. And I, I, I mean, I have lots of memories about it. And we've just gone through the exercise of a documentary. Banger Films is making a – so there's been a lot of rehashing. We did a fan fest back in November of 2019, and they made a museum, and they had pictures. So we At the high school? high school? No, 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 in a warehouse. Oh. And Triumph played. We actually got up for fans that they'd flown in from all over the world, Brazil and Sweden and, and, and uh, uh, you know, the States. And, yeah, so – uh, there's been a lot of this, you know, traipsing back down memory lane and that gig with the, with the first one, you know, I'm obviously, there's been a lot of talk about it. We played China Grove as the closer, the set closer, because it had, you know, the gang, gang, chicky, chicky, gang, yeah, the gang, brother, sure, yeah. So you could blow off flash pots, go pow, 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 pow. So that's, that's a memory I have of that. That is cool. <laughs> first gig, you're blowing shit up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> and as we did for the rest of our careers, until <laughs> we just blew up the career itself. Yeah, man. That ha somebody, I had somebody on here uh, recently that said, uh, only successful bands argue. They said the band doesn't start arguing until it gets successful. And it was probably a lot of truth in that. Yeah. And the things that you argue about change. You of know, course. When, when yeah. you start and you haven't got a pot to piss in, you're all arguing about, you know, the building of a pot. The art, art. Well, yeah. you know, whatever, whatever's going to make your band become successful, you know. Mm. And uh, then when you get success, and that's, I mean, what are we talking about? You know, five percent of bands that start, maybe less. Maybe, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, only ten percent of bands that make a first album make a second. 
Yeah, I'm not surprised. That, that's a that's wow. a known statistic. So, um, but once you have success, that you know, then what's happening in a band's life? You know, guys are getting married and having kids, and you know, there's houses now, and there's real estate investments, and there's so now there's arguing about money and about power. You know, that's that becomes the things that they fight about, and then that's why bands break up. Yeah, because George mm-hmm. Harrison isn't getting enough songs on the Beatles records. <laughs> Uh, okay. Nine, by 1980, five years later, <clears throat> things had really taken off. So you're in your late twenties. Question was during this period of time, as this started happening, as the money started coming and as the, um, people are nuts for celebrities. And as that started happening, so you become, or the, the guitar player in triumph becomes in demand everybody wants a piece of you how did you maintain how did you keep grounded you know how did you maintain your and not get all caught up in this stuff uh well i think the simple answer to that and i'm going to try and give you some short simple answers it's not my style but um no you don't have to man just be yeah, yourself if i please. ramble though you know no, I know you're fine. Questions. I know how many questions you had. I'm looking I know, but I love, Trust me okay, on so this. So here's the thing. <laughs> I, my answer to this question is, is uh, for me personally, I didn't get into it so that I could become rich and famous. Um, rich would be nice. Rich would be fabulous. But famous was almost, it was never really part of the equation. And I, I say this, I had a gift for being a kind of a class clown quick wit, quick lip, blah, blah, like the kinds of things that showbiz gets built on. I was pretty good at it, but I never really gave a shit about it. Yeah. I, I really did care deeply about music. I loved music. So, you know, um, the success was great and the money was great. Being famous, it, it, that was a sort of a, a burden, you know, a, a thing that was getting in the way of, of other stuff that I wanted to try and do. So I already had a kind of a, what I would call a modest, humble grounding. Yeah. Because yeah. I saw music as this infinite challenge. It was like, this is going to be for the rest of my life. And you're never even going to get close to it. Every time you get looking at it, it's like you're staring into the face of God. It's like, yeah. oh, this is ridiculous, you know. So um, I think that's what kept me humble. And I think eventually it also led to me leaving the band and, you know, going out on my own and, you know, decide, like, you know what jazz music is in the marketplace right now? The, like, what is the jazz market? And you want to take a guess? You mean as a percentage of? Yeah, as a percentage of the music business, what is jazz? As a percentage, you're talking about revenue or population of artists? What? what like yeah, what's... everything. Yeah, okay. well, revenue. Let's start, let's you know that's that's your bottom line. That's okay. the revenue. I would have to say it's under five percent. Yeah, it's one percent right yeah. now. When I was teaching college, it was three, so yeah. it's been going down. You know, yeah. so, and I'm not going to get into the you know the advent of other cultural memes and things yeah. that you know have started to take marketplace away. I'm just saying, there's not a lot of people that are into jazz music the ones that are know that it's probably the highest of all musical callings you know it's the most challenging certainly it's the deepest and you know it even presents more of a challenge than classical music you know um i think personally but classical is probably only you know another four or five percent of the marketplace really it's yeah it's tiny yeah. but those are the things that really actually have the you know you know, to, to me, the depth, you know, the substance. So, you know, and I'm not uh, necessarily, I don't consider myself to be that substantial uh, a musician necessarily, you know, but I think that's true of if you had Pat Metheny here, he'd be, he'd be humble too, you know, because yeah, but that's, not ac- he looks- that's, that's not accurate. What you just said. I mean, I understand the humility of it and, you know, I, probably would be saying the same thing if I had that kind of talent. But the fact is you are a, a, a very talented player and I'm not just saying it to blow smoke up your ass. I assure no, you. I mean, thank you. And I, yeah. I appreciate that. But the thing is, you know, um, before we, you know, before you edited this, <laughs> <laughs> when we were talking before we got started, yeah. we were talking 
thinking about, you know, the sort of the ignorance and the stupidity of so much of, of culture, of society, and how it gets pretty frustrating, you know. Um, and I taught college for a couple of decades, you know, and I had college kids that had passed auditions to get into that program. And I would be going, you know, kid, you're going to make me tear my hair out here. <laughs> you know, you know, come on, try and meet me halfway on this, okay? Um, <laughs> so you can become misanthropic, yeah, you know, totally. in, in, the, in light of a lot of this stuff. So this is where this thing about humility comes in. Like in the end, I'm going to be the judge of me. Thank you very much. You right. know, like I enjoy talking to you, but you're not going to be the guy that decides what's going to be right for me. Absolutely. Gonna, nor should I hope not. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's what artists do. Are, you know, of all stripes. Yeah. yeah, man. They they allow themselves. It's interesting because it's, you know, the entertainment business. I could see where this is a problem having spoken to so many people because it's one of the few industries where literally your status, many times your financial wherewithal is determined by how many people or by how people like you, how much people like you. And I can see that becoming very hard not to be your man your mantra of well how do i de i'm defining my you know you got to work to not define yourself by how yeah, others it's, like you it's a game of balance right like if yeah. you're in commercial music it's commercial yes it's, you know it's called music business business is a bigger word than music like, yeah that's a pretty fundamental kind of thing and you're trying to find that balance point where can i you know my art my calling and this idea of selling records. But I mean, you know, I saw a rough cut of the documentary the other day, and there's a quote on there that I was talking about how it was so uh, disappointing to me, depressing to be in a circumstance where you're realizing that the record company doesn't see you for what you think you are. And, you know, managers don't, and even the other guys in the band maybe don't, you know, and you, you start to get really, you know, disappointed that the music business is not, uh, you know, picking up on the things that you think you could commercially exploit and, and build and, and, you know, feel really good about. So, but that's just, that's the business. All right. You know, that's the paying of dues and the kicking of your ass and that's how it works. So how, when, when so to be specific managers or record companies, are you like, they'd look at you as a vehicle, as a means to an end and not as, Hey man, this guy's a really talented musician. Is, is that what you're saying? Or? Yeah. And, and, and they'll drop your contract in a heartbeat. If, if they think like, you know, an old adage was that record company guys used to just stand there and take up pieces of shit and throw them against the wall. And right. if they stuck, they'd go, Hey, this stuck. Great. Let's spend some money on it. Yeah. But, yeah. And they don't really, it's, they don't really care about, and certainly I find this more and more all the time. They don't build careers. They don't say, okay, this is the talent I've got. Now, I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to say that. I'm not going to paint with too broad a brush because, for example, this young girl, Billie Eilish, uh, that I'm seeing, she's yeah. really getting a lot of, you know, she's getting a lot of industry support from somewhere there to build her career. And it's a pretty interesting thing that she's doing. You know, every time, you know, your old school American Idol R&B singers would do their, you know, big shit, she's whispering. And yeah. Go, oh, that's pretty cool. You know, that's, she's onto something. So, and she's mainstream. She's doing the new James Bond movie. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, okay, you know, th there is still some of that that's alive and uh, it's nice to see it. It's just, I wish there was more of it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I could totally get that. I, I I know what you mean with the um, not thinking, you know, I have this saying, smart people realize how little they know and stupid people often think they know everything. So from a music standpoint, I could totally understand and very much appreciate your, you know, your perspective of, man, I have a long way to go, you know, because every, who I mean, there's so much, you know, if you're a student of whatever it is, you're a doing you realize man there's a ton of information out there i better not stop studying because i'll be behind the eight ball pretty damn quick so i totally yeah. get that man yep um what prompted you i mean you left to pursue a solo career in 88 i would imagine like most difficult decisions you didn't just think about it the day before and then go in that next day and say guys i'm done 
what what was like if you if you are comfortable the time frame from when it first came into your mind and what was sort of like the I hate to say the straw that broke the camel's back. What was the trigger that finally said, okay, I'm ready? Oh, it's accumulation of things. I mean, you know, when I even first started in the band, there were peas under the mattress. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, there's never, it it was never uh, like like, the, 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 the image that we would project to the public was three musketeers, you know, all for one and one for all. And, you know, that's, you know, party line that's yeah. company policy yeah, you know? totally um yeah it was a, it's a partnership and it was a business and you know so there's a mythology involved in us building an image you know but i mean there were always things where i was going yeah you know i'm not sure i'm an equal partner here you know and by the time we'd gone through you know geez, it was around 83 84 the other guys in the band decided they wanted to have a lawsuit against RCA to get out of the contract and move. And then that cost us millions of dollars Wow! to, to, to have to and MCA bought the contract with an advance against you know, our own royalties. We were using our own money, the oh. future money to buy ourselves out of one deal and move to another label. So Wait a we would have needed to. They bought your contract out, but they didn't buy it. They made a loan to you to buy the contract out. That again, is correct. To be paid back. Holy shit. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. 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 So you're, you're starting out with a, you know, you're, you're $3 million in the hole in your, yeah. in your royalty <sighs> yeah, account. So, and, you know, we never got back even. And I wasn't really a, a, a willing partner in that decision. I got outvoted. Yeah. You know? So, I mean, those, those are some, that's just one example. I can give you a dozen, I can right. give you two dozen, you sure. know, but because it accumulates over time, you yeah. know, so eventually you get to what now we'd made a record called sport of Kings in 87. The producer was a guy named Ron Nevison. And that was the thing that kind of drove the wedge. Nevison was a guy that had resurrected Jefferson starship and heart. And so MCA brought him in and it was like, he goes, all right, you guys can't really write your own hits. So I'm going to bring in songs from outside writers. And then, then in a complete betrayal and the subterfuge thing, he pulls me aside after we cut the beds. He goes, now when these get cut, you got to make sure they get cut in track in, in keys that you can sing. Cause the drummer's not going to sing anything. You're going to sing everything. And I went, you will never get that to fly. And then that toilet blew up when, in the, you know, when the shit was everywhere and he quit. Nevison quit the project. Mike Klink finished and Klink was a good guy. He eventually went on to do uh, Appetite oh. for Destruction for Guns N' Roses. Yeah. So Klink, he, he was a good engineer and he knew his shit. Uh, so he finished that album. But that album was, ooh, unhappy. We did a, a cover uh, for the Canadian Musician Magazine at the time and it was says, The Record from Hell. And it, it it was the beginning of the end. So we did one more record for uh, MCA, and then I, I quit. So you must have just like, when the pain of not quitting was greater than the pain of tolerating it, that's when, it, whatever that point was, that's when you finally pulled the trigger. That's exactly it. And, and there was, you know, there was financial issues, and there were, there were a lot of things that were going on, you know, but... The, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back was we're making an album and it's just, it's, it was an empty house. There was nothing in it for me to keep me there. Yeah. You know, um, N- not even money. So, sorry. Not even money because well, you had no, to pay back it, all this freaking money. Well, yeah, well, of course, but I would, I would be walking away from that debt when I quit. So, but MCA still wanted to sign me to my own, deal and i went i don't want to be with you you know yeah. please new a and r man go back to your record company and tell them to let me go that's what i really want i want to release just let me go so um yeah but i was becoming just and this is 1988 how long did it take before you know nirvana and soundgarden and I mean, oh the dude you're was- 18 months behind them behind destruction yeah yeah. Like the, the 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 scene was already changing anyways. Who wanted an MTV hairband? Yeah. That you know had had its hits back in the early eighties. Yeah. You know that I could read the writing on the wall there. You know. So. 
Hey. That being said, I give you a lot of credit because just to make decisions like that in general and act on them, you got to, you know, I got to respect you, man, because it's, you know, people have a tough time making decisions. People think all day, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm, but you got to do it and you did it. So congratulations to you. Well, man. thank you. But I, you know, again, I'm, I'm going to play a humility card here. And I'm gonna tell you this. <laughs> well, that's because you're a humble guy. I don't think you're playing yeah. a card. I get it, man. It's I'm, totally I'm going cool. to tell you about courage of convictions. All right. Yeah. Tell and me. This man. Is, and this is college professor coming out, you know, yeah, man, let's do it. Like, um, that's a muscle you gotta you gotta develop it if you want to be an artist, and you and you gotta have a courage of convictions. So, people that go, "Ooh, I, this is what I think, but I'm not gonna act on what I think," or "This is what I believe, but I'm not gonna act on what I believe," like it, it eventually got to the point with me where my muscles in that area had developed enough that I wasn't gonna not do it not doing it was going to be the thing like it was much more natural and organic for me to follow the courage of my convictions so i was only doing what comes natural to me which is a humility card i know but i'm just telling you that's how it works rick you are so right courage and conviction is a muscle you have to develop and man and i have talked to my kids about this ad infinitum because they don't you know once you it's like any other muscle once you exercise it it's stronger and then it's ready for the next thing and then it's ready for the next thing and you are so right it's and and the opposite is true every time you paralyze yourself and don't do that you set yourself back a peg and it you makes bet. it and, and this is it. like it goes to identity and image self-image yeah. and, and like identity so every time you exercise the muscle and and it, it grows stronger you're being more you yeah. And so, and who doesn't want to be comfortable in their own skin? That's yeah. the thing that I don't get. It's like, and I would tell college students, don't you want to be the best you? That's, yeah. you know, and stop comparing yourself to me and stop comparing yourself to the kid. And the, but just be you and be the best you. And that'll be great. And it, that's pretty superficial, really, in the end. I mean, what does Simon Cowell say to those? American Idol kids, just give me the best you, you know, like it, it is, it's a cliche, but it's a, it's a powerful one. It's a real powerful one because man, if you are able to be yourself, your life's going to be pretty okay. You know, you're not going to have too many regrets. You're going to mess up because we all do because nobody knows all the answers, but man, you'll be able to sleep at night. Man. So I, yeah, it's really good advice. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Some nights. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Now I'm going to, you know, to bust your humility thing. Uh, you're a great soloist, man. Um, and you're especially good at creating musical climaxes. And you do this often and well enough, sometimes multiple times within a solo even. And it's very deliberate. It, this isn't random. You're not randomly doing this. And I got to believe that somehow that's tied into your uh, quality of your right, your ability as a writer. Uh, can you just like talk about that? I mean, cause you're, yep. you're, I mean, ding, ding, ding. I mean, you, you, you've answered <laughs> your own question really, you know, uh, everything is to me is writing. Everything is form. Everything is construction, you know? And, uh, as I said, I had a gift as a, at an early age and like, you know, something would be going on in the classroom and I couldn't help myself. I was going to pop, I was going to shoot something out of my mouth that was <laughs> going to make the whole class just break up, you know? So it, the whole thing is timing and, and you know, that you've got, you've had that thing happen at the right time. Right. So and good comics have good timing and writers understand that you're building a story along a certain arc and then things have to happen on, along the arc in order for the story to really resonate. Right. So that's what it is. It's storytelling, you know, and um, I felt like I had a kind of a, a, a gift for it, an ability. And when you play a guitar solo, it's no different than when you're writing a lyric, than when you're making a speech, than when you're telling a joke. It's timing, and you're going to have to put the right things in the right places. And you, you know, you got to get your syntax right. I would tell songwriters, you know, 
don't don't get your syntax wrong you know don't get your wrong syntax ish <laughs> you know <laughs> don't don't scramble it up there's there's a way that this flows that then it pays off and payoffs and hooks in songwriting you know in, in pop songs you know like you got to put it in the right place. The jeweler spends a lot of time trying to get that diamond just in the right place with all the little baguettes around it and stuff so that it sets it off, you know, yeah. and that's, that's what you're doing. You're just trying to figure out where the diamonds go. And you were always <laughs> very, that sound too simple? no, but you were always very cognizant of that and very deliberate about that in, in, in your plan. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Although, you know, I'll just pick a bone with you here, you know, uh, Yes, there's a, I'm, a, I'm aware of it, and yes, uh, uh, there's a deliberation there, but I can also tell you that there's nothing like when you just shut off and you are out there playing and something happens that's just extraordinary, that you, you weren't planning it, it just kind of mm. happened. And this is why guys like Charlie Parker end up you know, doing heroin <laughs> because they're trying to recapture <laughs> yeah. that moment of, you know, where you're, you've slipped the surly bonds as it were, you know, and you're, you're flying and you're not even thinking about it. It's just happening. And that's a beautiful thing. And sometimes when you're doing overdubs on an album, that's what you want. You, you kind of want a moment like that. Now, you might go back and, and use that moment just to inspire, you know, a, a more pedantic kind of constructionary approach. I don't know if that's a word, constructionary, but, you know, um, but there's also times like, you know, you're on stage and you're just improvising. You're just going by the seat of your pants. And, oh, man, that is that's as good as it gets. Yeah. And there's there's very little. Yes, there's all of this storytelling you know, uh, structure that's part of who I am. So that's certainly playing a part in the way that this, this unfolds. Charlie Parker knows how to blow over changes. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. he, he knows that in order to do what he's doing. But yeah. I want to talk about, uh, you have a song called Human Race in the Resolution 9. Why is it capital R-E-S for Resolution because uh, the name of the band was Resolution 9, but the album was Res 9. It, it was oh, a short form. okay. Okay? And we call that because it's the it was Rick Emmett's solution. Oh, so okay. I, I had a record deal with, uh, uh, oh, man, I can't remember their name now. They were out of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, That's great, man. That's classic. I know. I'm sorry. It's, it's slipped my mind. I'm, I turned 67 on my next birthday. Don't laugh at me. Oh, dude. Yeah, so, let me tell you, man. I got anybody just listening to the audio. This guy looks great. He could get back. I don't know if he can get back in his stretchy pants, but he looks great. He looks like a rock star just today, man. So don't listen to this nonsense. Oh, uh, yeah. So I made this uh, an, uh, deal and I was, you know, I put a little band together and it sort of solved my issue of how I was going to make this happen. I really wanted it to be like a, like an old blue note record, except a, a rock record yeah. that would just four guys in the studio, just, you know, really coming together and, and having, you know, I'm doing this for the camera's benefit. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you that are listening to audio, I'm making my fingers integrate. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so R E is Rick Emmett and Solution. So it was R E S. Got it. Res nine. And we picked the number nine because my guitar player friend Dave Dunlop, he's crazy about the number nine. He plays a lot of pickup hockey. He wears number nine. You know, he thinks nine is a magic number. And of course in the Chinese culture it is. I it's thought eight was magic. I thought eight was oh, magic. Nine is the big one. Oh, nine's a big one. Yeah. yeah See all yeah. these cerebral guys, man. I can't keep up. Uh <laughs> you uh there's a song in, in, in Human Race, and I just want to read the lyric because it's really cool. It's, um, sometimes I almost catch the things I chase. That's why I keep on running in the human race. And you were kind enough to send me some backstory notes to that, explaining it. And I thought it was really cool, so maybe you could share it with the listeners. Yeah, I mean... I, I, the whole idea of, of 
being an artist, I think, is is uh, you're horizon oriented, you know. So even the present moment, which you can sometimes be lost in, and it's fabulous. You've got a sense of flow, uh, and it's really great. But you know, an artist is kind of going, yeah, yeah. But what's that up there on the horizon? Well, I gotta I gotta go and find. I gotta see what that is. So that's the thing. Is is like. You're almost catching what you're chasing, but not quite. And even if you did catch it and had it for a little bit, you know, then you wake up the next morning and you go, okay, that was okay. But, <laughs> you know, so explorer thing, you know, uh, adventurer, you know, I think that's a, that's a part of the spirit. And um, when I was a kid, I was a runner. I was a sprinter and I was a good one. I would win school races and, and school district races and, uh, yeah, when I was like uh, maybe 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, when I was 15, uh, in playing f- high school football, guys were starting to be able to catch me. When I was 16, my bones were getting broken. When I was 17, my knee got torn up. So, so you played, wait a minute, you're playing like pro- like American football, not soccer. Well, it's, Canadian football is three down football, but yes, it, it's, oh, played okay. on, it's played on a bigger field. You know, it's, it's, uh, uh, 55 yards to center field and the end zones are huge so that you can throw a, a 30 yard pass from the two yard line way into the end zone. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. So yeah. Canadian football is, um, yeah, three downs anyways, but yeah, I loved football. I loved soccer. I loved baseball. I loved sports. I mm. wanted to be a jock. I didn't want to be a musician, you know, when I was younger, but, uh, but anyways, that whole idea of running, like the to know the thrill of, uh, you know, when I was the summer of, ooh, am I going to remember the year? I think when I was when I turned sixteen, I ran a ten flat hundred yard dash at the police games in Toronto. Ten seconds so, flat. Ten second flat. Won the That's... race. Got my name in the paper. Got a trophy. You know. And when I went back to high school that that fall, it was like ooh, and. They're tearing down my old high school, but there's a board by the gym that has my name on it, Richard Emmett, you know, because I held the school record for the 100-yard dash. And, of course, the next year, they changed from yards to meters. So <laughs> I was guaranteed that no one would ever break that record. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I-, I loved running. I loved sprinting. So um, I think that's part of it, too. I was playing off the idea of race being. Of, of racing, Yeah. But I think what you said is really true about chasing. And I don't did here, you said mention it, right? I thought so. You said collectors, guitar collectors. It's collectors of anything. Cause I used to collect like when I was much younger, fountain pens. And oh, yeah. then I stopped doing it when I realized I'm like, wait a minute, I'm waiting for this holy grail fountain pen. Like <laughs> Uh, and then I sold them all and I just like use them all now. I have like 10 and I use all of them as when I, yeah. cause I like to write, you know, yes. and it's, it's the same thing. You're yeah. right, man. It's yeah. Like, it says, says the guy sitting there with four electric guitars behind him that anybody would drool a little bit over. But I don't, col- I play all of them. I don't collect any of them. D- D- does your wife say, Hey, Craig, you know, how many do you need when you're playing? No, you only need one. Cause she's that's what wonder- my wife says. No, she's wonderful, man. She's puts up 27 years of, I don't know how. I mean, you Yeah, know. well, I'm 44, so. Yeah, like you, she said to me last week, she goes, uh, you know, I've run a marketing company the last 20 years. She goes, you should really write, a, put a product together on sales because you have bullshit me so well in so many situations. And I've never lied to her once. I've, I don't know what she was talking about. I've, I, I'm not a liar. So I don't, I said, okay, I just, I didn't want to delve into it. Like, I think she just meant persuaded is probably. Yes, you know, you're, you're a marketer. Yeah, well, marketer is the art of persuasion. Yeah, yes. I've never lied once, especially to her. I don't, anyway, Rick, uh, what are the top three experiences you had musically? Knee jerk reaction. Um, top three. Wow. Um, I don't know. I mean, I got to play the US Festival in California in 1983. There were a quarter of a million people there. You know, that was a pretty surreal experience. How many people in their lifetime get to go to a gig in a helicopter? Yeah, that's <laughs> you know pretty I mean? cool. A quarter of a million people. I can't imagine what that's like. It was insane. And I've said this many times, quotes, but it was such a hot day and it was mostly white guys and they all took their shirts off. So it was this pink flesh 
<laughs> that went as far as your eye could see. You know? yeah. It was funny. just crazy. Yeah. It was, was that the Van so, Halen was on that festival too? Yeah, they were. Yeah. Yeah. Ozzy, Scorps, uh, yeah. um, Judas Priest. Yeah. It was quite a day. Yeah. We were the band in white. <laughs> we weren't wearing studs and leather. You didn't have studs and leather, man. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Dust Festival. So I would say uh, you want 3 A. Eh? Okay. How about George Benson getting up and playing with my band at the Buffalo Guitar Festival? That's I really think that was around cool. 2000, 2001 or something. Holy shit. That was like a, a crazy dream come true that Benson would get up and play with me. But I mean, I've played with Steve Morse and yeah. it, and he's one of the greatest guitar players on the planet, he, you know, and again, so humble. <laughs> what a, I had him on here. What a, not, you know what? You actually, remind, he, you're like a talkative version of Steve Morse actually. Uh, he's well, that's, quiet. Yeah, man. He's a nice guy. You know, he lives here and like north of me a little bit. Yeah. Florida, and, yeah. And, what a nice guy, man. And, and, and he, he, that's those still waters run pretty deep. Right. So that, that was a great thing, but I've played with Steve Vai at GIT in about 1985 or 86, somewhere around there. And that was before Vi had just sort of, you know, kind of really established himself. And I had, I spent a great day with him. Really sweet. Another really um, nice guy, yeah. Oh, and an unbelievable guitarist, just yeah. you know, insanely good. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I've had I. There's nothing like uh, being in the room when your kids are being born. <laughs> yeah, I mean? like yeah. I don't want to make this always be about music. You know, there's there's been. Uh, How many so kids? I think I was two? pretty lucky when 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 I married Jeanette Ann Bernadette Grew. Like that was a pretty lucky thing for me. You know, so. I've had some pretty good moments in my life. I'm not going to make them all be musical. Well, 44 years, man. Congratulations. That's awesome. That's Thank not you. easy, man. Honestly, congratulations on that. Yeah, I know. Very <laughs> inspiring. Oh, it's not, man. Come on. You know, even, I mean, even when you get along great and you genuinely care for the other person and you're compatible, it's not easy, man. Especially like if you're home a lot, you know, it's, yep. it's tough. Well, and in truth, there were all those years where, you know, touring, it, uh, the two expressions I would use are absence makes the heart grow fonder yeah. and familiarity breeds contempt. Contempt, yeah. <laughs> you know? so it's like... It's good to that, go and good to come home. It was going, okay, I'm going out for another uh, week and a half. Okay, good. See ya. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 not easy, man. Anybody who, no. who, you know, and you sound like you have a nice relationship. So if you, you know, you got to work at that. People, it, you have to work. It's like anything else, you know, you got to work at it. Give you, and bet. Take. you bet. You bet. Uh, your childhood, where did you grow up? Where, where in Canada? West End, Toronto. What was your growing up like? What was your childhood like? Uh, it was pretty good. Like it was not a, you know, uh, we didn't have a lot of money. Uh, my dad worked as a, he worked his way up in the payroll department at Canadian Pacific Express, but he'd started as a humble clerk and, uh, and he was a company man. My mom didn't work. She was a stay-at-home mom. But she did become a librarian later in her life after her boys had gone, all got to high school. And, um, yeah, you know, I mean, uh, we, we couldn't afford a piano. So, you know, musically, all I, the, the first guitar I got was a borrowed one from my grandfather's sister that was like a 1940-something Stella it wasn't even a Stella. I don't know what it was, but it had palm trees stenciled on the front, you know, <laughs> like a, 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 a Sears catalog kind of, you know. Yeah. So I, it was, that was my first one. And, um, but you know, my life was good. I, I think I mean, the thing I wrote you, I told you, you know, the whole world changed for everybody. My, my age, the, the yeah. boomers, when the Beatles played Ed Sullivan in 64, it was like, okay, the world has changed. And, you know, of course, I was discovering that I could get my guitar and sit on the front lawn and the girls in the neighborhood would come. Right. <laughs> hey, you know, hey, there's something going on here, you know. So, yeah, it was a pretty good life. You wrote, if you're comfortable talking about this, if you're not, it's totally cool. You wrote that uh, at some, shortly after that, the Beatles, your your grandfather passed. And you started questioning religion and God. Were you, did you grow up like in the church or yep. like you did? Yeah. 
the United Church of Canada, my mom was very religious and she sang in the choir. And as soon as I was, I think it was maybe seven or eight, I, I probably sang in, in Christmas pageants. And then I was literally in the choir. I was a first soprano, boy soprano, maybe eight years old, mm. sang in the school choirs and stuff. But it was because of church choir exposure. But when I was 11, my, my grandfather died. And that started me to sort of question all this thing about afterlife and God in heaven and all that stuff. And, you know, slowly but surely it was becoming a rift between me and my mom. And, you know, yeah, by the time I was 13, 14, <laughs> you know, I had become one of those dreaded secular atheist, uh, yeah. you know, humanist, uh, uh Oh, you know, ag I'd say agnostic more than atheist, but you know, nevertheless, yeah. You, know, you're, you just got put yeah, off the church dogma. But yeah, partly it was religion and, and dogma. That's part of it. But it's also just, as Hitchens would say, that whole God delusion thing of, of uh, people that, that believe that. And I see it as an egotistical thing. You know, they're going to die, but they, oh, they still get to be themselves in heaven. In, and in, you go, yeah. yeah, you know, I think once your brain's done, you're done. Like, I've <laughs> had major surgeries where I've had, you know, general <laughs> anesthetic. And there's no uh, going towards the light. There's no winged yeah. people that are coming to, like, there's none of that. You're you're gone, you know. And then when you wake up from the anesthetic, you're incredibly nauseous, you know. But, uh, that, yeah. But so that, I, that's, yeah. I'm that not, that not being said, you have a very service-oriented um really like your attitude at least and again i'm not blown i'm not that guy to just say shit to blow smoke up people's asses you have a very service oriented attitude uh about you yeah that's true yeah, yeah because i think i always felt part of my you know i'm doing i'm doing quote marks <laughs> for the camera um part of my gift it was that I, I I had to teach. I had to try and help. I had to try and use whatever sort of, you know, thing that I had to try and make life better for other people. So it's a very humanist kind of service. And I, the other thing, you know, you and I were talking before we got started and you were talking about stupidity and ignorance. And I, I feel like we all have a duty to try and keep finding the best about other people the yeah. best of them and raise the best of them up, raise, find the best of ourselves and, and, and lift that up. You can't wallow in, in that defeatist kind of negativity. You know, that's, that's a, that's a bad fight. That's a dirty fight. You want, the, you want the clean fight. You want the good one, yeah. you know? So um, that, I think that's about trying to be a good parent, trying to be a good teacher, trying to, you know, trying to be a good teammate, trying to be a good, like whatever, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What's, what's interesting about all these things you're talking about is for, I have found, I've made decisions specifically over the last five to 10 years that are geared towards reducing my stress. And the ironic thing about all those decisions are not only do they reduce your stress, they make you a better person for yourself, but for others. You know, how you look at people, how you interact with people. It's funny the things that, like, why don't people tell us this when we're young? <laughs> Do the shit that doesn't bother you and life is easy and you'll be more well-liked and, you're, you know, it's easy to deal with people. It's funny, like, how all that works. Yeah, but, you know, I mean, and, you know, we're sort of uh, cranking a little negative on religion here, but there are certain moralities that come out of religion that are good ones. You know, the golden 100%. rule is, is, is it's in every religion on the face of the earth, you know? And, you know, I, I think in my thing to you, I wrote, you know, Dylan said, you, you got to serve somebody Yeah. and why not serve other people? You know, right. why, well, it doesn't have to be God, right. you know, just serve the people in your community, you know, serve right. your family, you know? Right. Yeah. All right. What were some of the low points? or darker periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? Oh, geez. I mean, you know, I've had, my mom died. My, 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 both of my brothers have died from cancer. My younger brother in particular, he still comes visit me in dreams. So that's, 
that's a tough one. Um, yeah. My wife has had, she broke her neck in a car accident. She at one point had her colon burst on her. Like we've been through some crazy things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and it's, it's not much fun. Like I, one of my daughters played uh, competitive soccer, broke her wrist once and I had to take her to the emergency and had to sit in the uh, treatment room while they were putting her arm back in with no anesthetic. <laughs> oh, resetting it. Oh, okay. oh, that was one of the worst things of my life. You know, that was just, oh, yeah, I could hardly stand that. But, yeah. you know, you survive these things. And then yeah. here I am in a little yeah. box on the internet. <laughs> uh, is there any advice you'd go back, if you could give yourself advice, anything you would advise yourself, assuming you would have listened, that would have made your life easier? Um, I don't know. I'm, you know, I tend to be, I think, and from my father, I inherited a lot of kind of cynical, stoical, uh, sarcastic, you know, uh, outlooks. And I honestly kind of feel like if I hadn't made the mistakes I made, I wouldn't be where I am. And there, the, Ray Bradbury was one of my favorite writers when I was a young teenager. And he had, I can't remember the story, but a short story where, you know, the guys had figured out they could go into the future. And then you're not supposed to step off the, you know, the floating sidewalk when you're going to hunt dinosaurs, whatever the fucking story was. <laughs> and, you know, the guy stepped on a butterfly. And so that whole thing about the butterfly effect, it's like, the, the, when he came back to his present, uh, he'd changed the the, the 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 course of of time, the course yeah. of, of history. Yeah. You know, just by stepping on a butterfly. So you know, I kind of feel like I wouldn't. I you know, I have to make the mistakes in order to sort of figure out who I am. You know, and I've made some bad ones. <laughs> oh man, you know? who hasn't? Yeah. So who you know. You got to own them, I think. You know, I think that's part of the journey is that you got to own the, the bet. So, you know, would I go back? I think I would give myself advice and say, you know, don't sweat it as deep as you do. Don't let it, you know, kill you as much as it's killing you. Like, you'll actually, you know, this is, I think George Harrison had an album, This Too Shall Pass. Like, all things shall know, pass. Again, another cliche. I, I, this is what I deal in, is cliches, really. That's all right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, let's talk about gear for a few minutes. Tell me, do you, I mean, do you still, I'm assuming you still practice knowing you a little bit now. Yeah. It's not so much practicing as, as you know, uh, working on repertoire, yeah. you know, and, and, um, and writing, you know, developing ideas and then learning how to play what I'm writing. You know, that's yeah. a big, one. that's a big ass kicker for me. Uh, Cause I can write above my head, you know, and then I have to get my hands to be able to, to yeah. figure it out, you know? Um, but uh, yeah. So the, the, what's the, what was the big question again? The wider question? No, I was just, I, I, if you still practice, which yeah, you answered. I mean, not really. And I never was much one for scales and studies and like, uh, to me, it was like, why wouldn't you just make music? <laughs> Instead yeah. of making the, the things that pretend to be music or that are giving you practice to be music, I go, no, no, I'm just going right to the music. I'm a little too impatient for all that. Other I'm, stuff. I'm the same. I agree with you hundred yeah. percent. I want to do stuff. That's fun. I got X amount of time here, man. I'm, I'm not. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, there are things where like, you know, if I'm playing one of my pieces and I make bugger it up, I go, okay, better wait, go back. And I play it again and again and again. And again, because there's nothing like repetition and yeah. there's nothing like, okay, slow it down until you can get it, you idiot. And then, you know, nice and slow and, you know, then work it up. Like those are, you can play anything if, if you, you yeah. follow that technique of, yeah. So that's what I do. Um, guitar wise, what's your go-to guitar right now? Has this changed over time? And what other few guitars would round out your top selection? I've been going through a telly phase lately. Uh, there's a f- friend of mine, Mike Smith Smitty, that he uh, he w- he's a big telly guy, and then so he got me into it. And, and when he was starting doing the Luther 
year work on my guitars and stuff. And um, so, and that uh, a guy that I really admired, Ed Bickert, passed away a couple of years back. And Ed was a tremendous jazz guitar player who played on an old telly that was beat up to shit. And um, I wanted one, and I, you're never going to get it from his family. Like, you know, he had uh, two sons and a daughter, so the guitar is going to stay in the family. So I got uh, MGT bodies to make me this beat up relic of a body, and I got a neck made, and and uh, I had Smitty put together, and I got a sticker for the headstock. Instead of saying Fender, it says Bickert Deluxe. Oh, that's cool! And, and I got I got it made. There's a place in the states you can get them made online, and um, so I've got this, you know, uh, old '59 humbucker style uh, telly that I really love, and I'm, but I, then I got one, I go, well, I, I need one with a bridge pickup too. So I got another one that has two humbuckers and, um, and I put an old Fender Esquire neck on there that I had. And, uh, and I've got a, one of the new white uh, tellies that they make that are light. I think they make them in Mexico, I'm not sure, but um, really like that guitar. I used it for five of the six guitar pieces that are part of my new uh, bonfire stuff. Um, through a little lunch pail amp, a little Yamaha lunch pail amp kind of. That's cool. It was great. It sounded really, really good. So, but, I mean, having said all that, I've had a nice relationship with Godin. They make uh, Canadian guitars, like uh, electric acoustics and stuff. And uh, they have one, the top of the line is called a Supreme. And I got two of them that they made for me. One of them is kind of my go-to when I'm sitting around watching TV and I'm just going to be plinking and plunking. The Godin Supreme is often the one that I go to. And when I play gig, with Dave, and I used to, but I've sort of been in semi-retirement, but um, that's an A6, a Godan A6. So that's a kind of a crossbreed. It kind of looks a little bit like a telly, but it's got an acoustic bridge. It's got a humbucker, but it's got a piezo in there, or a piezo, or however you Floridians pronounce that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> piezo, piezo, yeah. piezo. Anyhow, um, yeah, and, and it's, a, it's a nice guitar. Uh, that's my go-to for live gigs and then when i did the triumph reunion i used my less balls like i got balls. three less balls and when it comes to rock you really sort of can't beat the less ball and even though i don't use a marshall you're really just using marshall sounds you know from i got a nice amp a red plate yeah out of arizona, arizona. I think, right? yeah yeah a really nice amp you know point to point hand wired and it's it but uh, you know i kind of just use it for marshalling up my sound you know yeah. Are you a Les Paul? They must be boats, like real heavy. No. Oh, no, they're, not. they're all uh, from the 2000s, oh, and okay. they're all chambered. So they're okay. really light, actually. Yeah. They're Les Paul Classics is actually the, the one that I prefer. Dude, that's what I have sitting right here, Les Paul Classics. Same thing. It's perfect, man. I only just yeah. I changed the pickups because the Classics have these heavy, loud, you know. Yes. Yeah, they have the 4, 498. Yeah, yeah, 490, yeah. 498. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I liked them. They were snotty, but I changed mine out too. I have Smitty makes pickups. That's his his company is MJS Pickups, and he he's put all the pickups in all my guitars. So, yeah, he put that's how it started. He replaced the pickups in my Les Pauls and made them like creamy smooth yabba dabba doo, you know, yeah. like really nice. And um, yeah. So and I got a black one classic, and I got a sunburst, like a sort of a T burst, and I've mm -hmm. got um. One that I refinished had refinished, and I call it amber, and it kind of looks like a, it's a flame pop, but it's kind of yeah brown amberish turns red to the edges. Very cool. Sweet. You know what? You mentioned Godin. I we should I should give a shout out. I apologize, Mario Bifferali, awesome guy, and Andy Curran. Uh, both those guys wound up connecting us. So man, I forgot to say at the beginning. Thank you guys. I appreciate it. Oh yeah, well Andy's the guy that hooked us up, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I love Andy. He's a great guy. Yeah. And he's got his finger in a lot of pies, that boy. He does, man. He, I don't I don't even know him, actually. Somebody... Oh! A buddy, he was a bass player in a, in a band called Coney Hatch. Oh, and, okay. Uh, that band back I've heard in the of, day, yeah. yeah. But he also became an r man at SRO Anthem for Rush. And right. so became good friends with Ray Daniels and the guys in the band and stuff. And... Uh, but he also, when the catalog, when the Rush catalog sold to uh, Robert Ott and his publishing publishing company, and he sort of became a publisher <laughs> and in, in tight with those guys. And so, yeah, fingering a lot of pies, but nice guy, good guy. Yeah, really nice, nice guy. Musician too. Really yeah, nice player. guy. 
Uh, what's your favorite song you wrote? Uh, the next one. <laughs> uh, you know what? I've heard that. Satriani said the same thing. Yeah, well, and that's the Horizon artist thing, you know. But, I mean, I've had some pretty satisfying moments in my life, you know, song-wise. Um, Suitcase Blues on the Just a Game album has kind of been a, a theme song of mine all my life. Play it as the encore song every night. Um, I think Hold On was a pretty good piece of songwriting. When Hell I did yeah. That one. Um, and, you know, there's been some anthems. Magic Power was a pretty good tune to me. Or, you know, I, there's some evergreen triumph stuff, you know. Um, so, I don't know. But uh, I, I've just, as I said, I released these new uh, Bonfire, Farewell to the Folk Songs and Farewell Bonfire. And there's like 18 songs that I wrote over the last, I don't know, five years kind of thing. And um, there's some in there that I, I'm I'm pretty proud of them. I, I, you know, I, I think I'm getting pretty good at this. <laughs> this song, I, <laughs> I think I'm getting the hang of it. That's pretty funny, Rick. I'm glad you're feeling so, man. Uh, favorite musicians you've enjoyed playing with? I'm sure there's been dozens of them over the years. Yeah, well, you know, I mentioned Benson and, and Vi and, and uh, geez, you know, Steve Morris. Oh, my God. You know, that was a dream come true kind of playing with him. Um, you guys even look alike a little bit. <laughs> you do. Well, he always had the really long straight hair. Yeah. But both... I, I, I was more into the MTV hair production. You know, no, but... we need a little product to try and get some size. And... But you got the long... You don't seem to have that problem. Kyle. I don't have any hair problems at all, man. I wake up. I... Gillette is my barber, man. A couple yeah, of times, that's good. times a week. That's it. Uh... I have a little bit of envy for that, Mr. Picard. <laughs> well, let me tell you, man. I'm lucky that I kind of look okay bald. Like I would, yeah, I don't know I, what it has to do. I'm happy with the way I look bald, you know, like, um, yeah. which is great because I had no choice. So like, I'm really grateful, <laughs> you know, like yes. what, yeah. I'm, I would have been screwed if I was unhappy, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. but uh, well, it's funny. I had an interview yesterday, I had Paul Jackson Jr. on and he told me, big LA session guy, uh, he told me George Benson, he played with George. That was one of his top three as well. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, Benson true. is, first of all, he's a lovely guy. Benson is a, is a cool guy. Uh, but he's also like a monster in the <laughs> sense of what he can do and how, and like he can just fly. Like he's like the Charlie Parker of, of guitar kind of, you know, in a way uh. notes wise and, and choice wise and stuff like he can just fly, you know, and so to be on stage with him, he's just cutting you so bad. Like he's cutting your grass so bad, but you don't care. You're just up there going, yeah, give me more of that, George. Yeah. That's, that's all right. Like that's just so great. And he's having such a fun time doing it. Like he's going, I am going to bury you so deep. Just watch this. Uh, <laughs> like that's just, it's great. And he's laughing the whole time. You know, That's so, cool. Uh, yeah. Good. Some Benson, Morris, Vi, anybody else? Well, I mean, musician, like I love playing with Dave Dunlop. You know, I, I've been lucky that I've had him in my life. Um, I played with a drummer named Randy Cook, and your listeners should maybe track him down online. Randy is now sort of, <laughs> I think his handle was on, like his uh, email address was like drumhoor at mac.com. He's played with like f Five for Fighting and, uh, I mean, what, I saw him one night on a, I think it was Arsenio, not Arsenio, um, J Jay Leno, and he was playing with Ringo, no, he was on one of the others and he was playing with uh, Ringo Starr and, and Ringo Starr's All-Stars. So he's playing with Ringo. A week later, I, I see him on another talk show and he's playing with um, uh, Miley Cyrus's dad, Bill, Billy Ray Cyrus. Billy Cyrus. B wow. So I'm going... <laughs> He just goes out on tours. He, he plays albums. And Randy is an unbelievably great drummer, a white kid who cut his teeth in black bands when he was little. So plays funk and R&B like nobody's business, but became a rock drummer, you know, long-haired MTV kind of era guy. And now he lives in L.A. and he plays on sessions. Randy was one of the – he was one of the guys that really – when I left Triumph and he came into my band, he made me become a much better musician just by – 
proximity. You know, there's that old saying, always be the worst musician in the room. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You'll get better. Like Randy was a guy that made me realize my time was not very good. And Randy was like a human metronome, you know. So, um, yeah, I became a much better musician by playing with him. So big shout out to Cookie. Randy, is he a Canadian guy or an American guy? He was an Ameri- a Canadian guy, but he's now living in, in L.A. In yeah. LA. I know I've been, somebody has mentioned him to me because it's not the first time I've heard his name. Randy Cook, I will check him out for sure. Yeah. Uh, Tremendous drummer. Great, great drummer. Doesn't like jazz. So, he doesn't <laughs> play a lot of jazz, but everything else he can play the shit out of. That's nice, man. It's good to play with people like that, like you said. Oh, yeah. Knee-jerk reaction, top three Desert Island discs, just for right now. Yeah, uh, Steely Dan Asia. Um, I would. Uh, can I pick a greatest hits? Maybe a James Taylor greatest. Man, you hits. can pick, for you, Rick. You can pick a box set even. Okay, uh, then I'm, I'm going to have something by Matheny, and I really like the Matheny era. That where it was Matheny Group, and he did like uh, We Live Here, and um, uh. Well, First Circle was a pretty big record for me, too. I really loved that. Um, so I'd have to have something from Matheny. And maybe uh, JT by James Taylor, that's one. But how could I? When um, That's interesting. Little, I, I wasn't expecting you to say James Taylor. That's interesting. Oh, I love James Taylor. One of the best concerts I ever saw, James Taylor concerts. But uh, and I, you're talking to a closet folky here, buddy. Like, yeah. I played, I played uh, coffee houses when I was a teenager, as much as I played rock band gigs on a That's nylon string guitar playing, you know, Roy Clark's Malaguena, a James Taylor song, a Paul Simon tune. That was me when I was. Malaguena. What a great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Watch Roy oh, do yeah. that. My God. <laughs> yeah. I lifted that one. Um, yeah. Wait, I was on to something there. About uh, you. Before you we went got on the JT. Uh, I'm sorry. You were on. Uh... Oh, it was all right. Now I'm Canadian because I'm apologizing. See, you're, con- you're contagious here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, I was going to tell you a story about uh, uh, yes. um, Desert Island Discs. Yes. So on my honeymoon, well, my wife and I lived together uh, a year before we got married. So, But when we, we went to this place, we rented a house in, up in Barry's Bay, Ontario. And uh, on the stereo, we would put the Benson Masquerade album but it was one of those old stories where you could lift the arm and put it like lift it up and put it sideways. So the the record would just play over and over and over. And you can imagine what my wife and I were doing but that <laughs> record would play over and over and over. Planning your and future. That was one of the reasons. <laughs> when Benson got up to play with me in Buffalo, it was because I had sent a note through the promoter. And I knew the promoter of that festival was a guy that, like you said something about Santana and something when we were yeah. starting here. Mm-hmm. He wanted to get Santana and Clapton and somebody else together on stage. That was his dream of life, you know? And um, so I knew he liked the idea of collaboration. So I, I sent a note through the promoter to, to Benson that said, you know, your music was the music soundtrack of my uh, uh, honeymoon. You know, if you want to come and jam, get up in the encore. Because yours... His set started at eight o'clock and his show was at the big theater. I was playing a club up the street and I didn't go on until like 11, 1130. So he could easily make my last. So he, he came. The promoter apparently stapled the note to the paycheck so that his road manager had to bring him this note that said. That's you know, awesome. And so he came, he came with big bodyguards. He came to the club and he got up and he played. So yeah, soundtrack of my life. So that's very cool. The Masquerade album's got to be in there somewhere. Masquerade, yes, man. Tell me, um, best decision that you've made. It's probably gonna be marrying your wife. I guess you said that earlier, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think probably this next best decision that I ever made was that I would give up trying to be a jock and commit myself to becoming a, a musician. You, you're, you're in pretty good shape. I mean, you seem like you're in pretty good shape. You must still do some exercise or work out, right? 
Uh, a little, but you know, not a lot lately. My wife has just had one of her hips replaced, so the mm -hmm. last couple of weeks has been pretty much just, you know, cooking dinners and walking dogs. And, <laughs> you know, I've been doing loads of laundry. <laughs> nice. Hey, man, for better or worse, right? Yeah, that's it. Sure, but you know, you don't have to work out when you're when you're uh, getting enough housework in. Tough question, Rick. What do you like most about yourself? Uh, I like it when I'm having a sense of humor as opposed to when I'm, you know, getting angry. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, there's a side of me that I like more than other parts of me, you know. Um, I think everybody could say, I would think everybody could say that, right? Yeah, I, I, I think for me, I like the fact that in the end, my creativity comes to my rescue. How's that? That's fairly artistic. That is very artistic, right? That might be your quote. Yeah. That might be, you know, I put a quote at the top of everybody's name. That might be, no, that's not, I have your quote, actually. You said it earlier. It was really good. You said, um, courage and convictions, that's a muscle you have to develop. That was, that was right up. That was good, man. Thanks. Uh, you can quote me when you put, do your book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, happiest moment or happiest time in your life? Uh, oh, man. You know, right now, currently, it's when the grandkids visit or we go see them. Like, that's a, that's a really sweet joy to have in life. Mm. Um, but, you know, birth of my kids, uh, you know, marriage to my wife. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, Triumph just got to do the Walk of Fame induction thing back in November. That was pretty cool. You know, like pretty nice to be celebrated for a lifetime achievement kind of a thing. That's yeah. And here's here's a story. You'll love the story. My dad worked for Canadian Pacific Express. And the building used to sit at the corner of King and Simcoe in Toronto. And uh, he would go there. Simcoe every day. High School? Was that, that very same? No, 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 oh. no, no. There was, a, there was a guy that was one of the early settlers in Canada, and he was Lord Simcoe. And so a lot uh, of shit is named after him. I thought but, for a so, moment yeah. I was Canadian. Yeah, okay. So anyway, <laughs> it's King and Simcoe Street. And um, that building got torn down, and they built the, the concert hall. Roy Thompson Hall is there now. But that's where they do the sidewalk for the Walk of Fame. They do the, the, the chunks of sidewalk, King and Simcoe. So my name is going to be in a chunk of sidewalk where my dad went to work for 40 years. That's cool, like, man. Where he walked every day at lunch, you know, like. That's nice. Yeah, yeah that's good. Yeah. Man. yeah, it's a kind of a cool thing. What's the most important thing your dad taught you? Um, I think. My dad taught me to be realistic and practical and, you know, those things I mentioned earlier, stoicism and a little bit of cynicism. And like, I don't think you can survive in business if you don't have, if you're not suspicious about, you know, you, you can't just be gung ho about everything. You, you know, you have to sort of be very practical. And I would often be in triumph, the guy that would be going, Whoa, wait a sec, wait a sec. Let's, let's look at this from a different perspective. You know, and they would go, oh, Rick, you know, you're such a, you're being so negative. And I'm going, I'm not being negative. I'm being practical. I'm being realistic. So yeah. I think. You got to question a, everything, I think. Yeah, to a certain point. I mean, there's yeah. uh, there's times where you got to let yourself go and just, you know, take it for what it's worth and, and allow yourself that. But generally speaking, the big decisions, you do yeah. have to. Try. Yeah. Yeah. For sure, man. How about your mom? Most important thing she taught you. Oh, the artistic creative thing was my mom, you know, singing in the choir and stuff. And my mom would be washing the dishes and singing and, you know, like she would teach me songs. There's the Bower of Roses by Glendamere Stream and the Nightingale sings by it all the day long. Yeah, like those kinds of things. And there was, those are two-parters. Like she would sing harmony. Oh, yeah. that's good. Your voice was, your voice was really great, man. I'm saying was because I haven't heard you sing now, but I'm you're you had, well, you just did. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah, uh, no, but I it was really a, a joy to listen. I mean, it was perfect for that music that you were playing, man. It was really on. 
Thank you. Yeah, it's really yeah I, I, that's the you know big part of the natural gift that I had was that I had this voice that I could, you know, and I could sing high. I could sing higher than anybody else. Yeah. They, in grade eight, they moved me from the first sopranos over to the tenors just because they didn't want a boy on that side <laughs> of the stage anymore. You know? Yeah. I could still sing those notes. You know? that's, uh, do you have any hobbies outside of music? Um. Well, I used to be a cartoonist. I haven't really done much of that lately. But I mean, I, I I still love writing. I write emails. I write poetry. I I write uh, uh, posts on, on the sort of the forum on my members site uh, on my website all the every day. Oh, that's so, cool. Uh, yeah. Um, Do you know who talks to his members questions? a lot? Sorry, uh, a guy who talks to his members a lot. Another Canadian guy. I'm sure you know Frank Marino. Yeah. Yeah, he's always interacting with it, like like all the time. Same thing. Yeah, good for him. Yeah. Good for him. Nice guy. I, I saw him play once. Um, Frank was on the bill. We played the heavy metal Holocaust in in England, Stoke on Trent, England, and it was the headliners were um, Ozzy and Motorhead. Wow. And, and Frank said he was unbelievable. He must have had thirty pedals on the floor in front of him, and and he just he was mind-bogglingly good very yeah. Hendrix, obviously but yeah he's touring now good for him yeah he's got a got a pretty nice i'm little, retired yeah. i don't do that shit. you know he's touring now yeah <laughs> yeah ask me what my you know least favorite thing was and it was like i hated traveling man oh it's a tough it life brutal. man it's a very I tough life i couldn't do it anymore i just couldn't I well couldn't. the hat knowing it would have like a I'm not going to call you a homebody because I don't know you well enough to call you a homebody, but knowing what a, uh, uh, how happy you are in your relationship, that had to be really difficult to do, man. I mean, I couldn't do it, you know? Yeah. But I mean, you know, after a lifetime of it, now it's become hard. Like I stopped playing gigs January of last year. Mm. So it's been over a year and I'm just kind of settling into it now because mm. you come, you're addicted to the whole idea of, instant gratification and, and audiences telling you how lovely you are and how great you are. And, and then just that whole thing of performance, the moment of performance, you're addicted to that, that, you know, you gear yourself up and you do this thing, you know, again, that's the jock thing in me. Yeah. That it was like th that moment of performance is there's, that's there's something beautiful about that. <clears throat> so you miss that, but I don't miss the traveling. I don't miss the airports and the in and out of hotels and in and out of cabs and limos. And yeah, thank you very much. No, thank you. Yeah, man. I totally get that. Hey, two more questions. Uh, Good. <laughs> toughest decision. It's only been two hours. <laughs> toughest decision you had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do. Uh, well, to quit the band act three, I had a friend in there named Denton Young in order to accept the triumph offer, that was pretty hard. That was a hard thing to do. I cried m m a few nights on that one. Uh, and then of course, quitting triumph. There's no doubt that was one of the hardest things I've had to do in my life. I carried that one around for years. I didn't talk to those guys for 20 years before wow. we had reunion. That's how, that's how ugly and bitter that one ended. And not, not, not anymore. We, fi we fixed it. That's you great. Know, my brother was dying of cancer, my younger brother. He sort of said to me, you know, you got you to gotta clean things up. You know? And I said, no, no, you do. And he goes, no, you do too. Like, everybody's got to do this. I went, okay, all right, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out. I'll see if I can't make it happen. Good for so, you, man. Well. Probably Probably felt good, good for my brother. Good for the other two guys for you know also wanting to make it happen. That's and nice, we did. Man. Yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a good story in the end. <laughs> well, we got to go into the Hall of Fame and everything. <laughs> That's nice, man. It's good that it ends like that. Last yeah. question, Rick. Biggest change in your personality over the last ten years, and how much of that change has been intentional? And how much is just a natural part of aging? Yeah. Whoa. That's a. That shotgun was double-barreled. Wow. Um, 
<laughs> you have tons of you have great one liners, man. You need to you need to put them. I've been need, in show business all my life, Craig. Yeah, but you need to like maybe you haven't noticed <laughs> little clips of this, like, well, that shotgun's double barreled, followed by the next one. You know, you need to put a whole like ream of them together. Yeah. In a video. Yeah. Well, again, the, uh, this is the class clown. Okay, when, you know. <laughs> um, okay, so let me see. I, I would say that I've been, you know, mellowing and learning to accept my aging, which I, I was, I was not comfortable with it when, you know, um, my sixties have been harder than my fifties, but now that I'm in the back end of them, I'm starting to feel like I'm getting the hang of it. Like I'm coming <laughs> to terms with the sore knees and the, you yeah. know the sore hips and the sore back and the sore neck and like you go okay well this is you know you gotta you gotta this becomes part of that humility thing that we've talked about yeah. as elite motif here in our conversation you know um because i've had a sweet ride so you got to be sort of grateful for that and if i could go back and change like you know you asked me earlier if i could go back and tell my high school football playing self no, don't do this. You're gonna you're gonna end up paying a, a big price for this later in your life with arthritis. <laughs> I once had a nurse that was doing X-rays that said to me, "If you could go back, you wouldn't change. It wouldn't change. You you wouldn't you do it again." And I went, "You're probably right. <laughs> I uh, probably would. Yeah. I would make the same mistakes, you know." So, I think I'm coming to terms with that that I would make the same mistakes, and that's that's what made me so. I'm I'm becoming accepting of that, you know, not not all not fast enough for my wife's <laughs> <laughs> happiness, I think, but you know, I think it's happening. Yeah, good so, man. Yeah, and and what was the other barrel? There was two. No, it was just, it was uh, that was it, man. It was really one. It was uh, biggest change in your personality over the last ten years, and how much of that has been intentional, and how much is oh intentionality? Yeah, 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 intentionality. Yeah, I think intentionality is sort of um that's not a word intent would be the word <laughs> intent but you're the first person i want to congratulate you because no one else has said leap motif and almost 700 shows so i mean you know rick this is like a we're having breakthroughs all yeah day. oh yeah yeah well that's that's ricard wagner for you leap motif right there oh you're just very I, you well know, read you could tell that that's all thank you yes sir i am um you don't get to teach college without being well read <laughs> yeah you'd hope anyway <laughs> you better do your research or else they're gonna cook you those kids yeah um anyhow uh so intent yeah uh i think uh like the whole idea of conscientiousness versus um just a kind of an unconscious you know zeitgeist the flowing through of, of life and you know th there's a balance that you try to strike there so you know there are things that you have to be intentional about but then there's other things where you have to sort of go i don't know how much of these choices that i'm making are actually organic ones they're the natural things that i'm choosing and we talked about this earlier where i sort of said well you know, here was this gift and it would lead me to make these kinds of choices. But then I was exercising that muscle, you know, that was me learning how to, and what did we call it? Um, I can't remember what we called it. What as far as exercising the muscle, it was courage and conviction is a yeah, muscle. So courage and conviction. Yeah. Yeah. So courage and convictions is like, if you had a conviction, is that not a natural thing? It is. So, yeah. Your your inclination is towards your conviction, but now the courage part, well, that becomes a little bit more, you got to be conscientious about this. You actually have to, you know, screw your courage to the sticking place, as Shakespeare would say, and you have to, you know, you have to go for that. And and um, so, again, it's this balancing of these of these two kind of yin-yang thingies, you know, and, and uh, trying to make it happen. So that's one of the secrets of life, by the way, is balance. Is balanced. You know, yeah, I'm trying to that. seek it. You're trying to find it. You know, uh, I think I'm getting better at it, but you know, it's an ongoing process, isn't oh, it? God, yeah. Oh, yeah. For, for me, yeah, certainly because is, man. my inner ear is not as good as it used to be. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I'm working on my balance. Yeah. Okay, Rick, so there you go. 
man, first of all, thank you very much. This is really a pleasure. It's so cool. Like, um, the fanboy in me really enjoys when I get to chat with somebody that I, I mean, I've listened to your music over and, you know, you have part of the fabric of my childhood, man. And for that, I want to thank you because you put out a hell of a ton of good, good music. Um, and it's so a real much. joy for me to sit and talk and get, you know, get to know you behind that. So thank right. you very much from a personal You're level welcome. and um, really cool to talk to you. Let me tell people what you got going on. Uh, I would love everybody to go to Rick Emmett and it's Rick R I K. Emmett, E-M-M-E-T-T dot com. He's got a new, it's a pretty extensive, he's calling it Bonfire Sessions, but it's Folk Songs for the Farewell, farewell Bonfire. He mentioned it. Uh, 24 pieces, I think. Well, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. There's. Uh, I did it in six packs. So the first one's come out, and I'm doing three sets of six songs each. Uh, so there's 18, and they're literally sort of, Springsteen, Nebraska ask, uh, like one of the first albums I ever got was Bob Dylan, 1962. It was called Bob Dylan. And uh, it's just him and his guitar. So I went, you know what? I'm going to come full circle. I'm, this is what I'm going to do for downloads. I'm going to do just me and one guitar. So there are uh, three songs that are with a, an electric guitar, uh, a telly, but the, the other ones are just me and a Yamaha L55 six string that I've had for a couple of decades and maybe three decades. and um, and then there's going to be six uh, fingerstyle jazz guitar pieces at the end. So they'll come out in these six packs. I don't, you know, we have to get them mixed. So we, we finished the first group. My engineer guy is working on the second. Um, and, yeah, they'll come out over the next month or so, I would think, a couple of months, who knows. But uh, You have an yeah, email? So eventually there will be 24 pieces of music, all told. And do you have an email list? Like if people can sign up on your email, you'll notify them when it comes out or is all your forums? Uh, yeah, well, you know, we got the Facebook and the uh, the uh, Twitter and all that. And uh, th th we do do those kinds of things. Okay. So that we, it, it, we, if you want to get onto my forum on my site, you actually have to, I, I charge people for that. Oh, no, that's cool. because I go there every day and Dude, I answer questions. That's, and That's awesome. I blog there. Yeah, so that, I think you. it's 35 bucks a year or something like that. But, you know, once those people are on there, they can literally, it's like they send me an email and I answer it. That's you know? pretty so, cool, man. Yeah. So that's where the, the songs are. You, the only place you can get them is, is uh, downloading them off the site. But you don't have to be a member to do that. But and, but you, you know, can buy them on the site. Yeah, and I think there's probably something there where you can s sign up to be on an email list or something on the site. I don't really right. pay attention to that because I have other people do it for me. So. No, I hear. So this is the deal. If you're interested and you want to, hey man, you want to connect with Rick and ask him more deep questions of life and solve the problems of the world together as we have done for two hours, <laughs> go join his forum because it sounds like it's a really inexpensive deal to get to hang out with Rick. Um, if you want to just get, let me just tell you, in all seriousness, he's a hell of a his jazz playing and his acoustic stuff is really phenomenal. It's well worth it. So go, you know, get at least the first six pack that's ready of this bonfire sessions and, uh, follow him on Facebook and Twitter and, um, anything else I'm leaving out. I feel like I need to sell something here for you. No, you've done a fine job, Mr. Garber. Thank you. All right. <laughs> Let me wrap this up, man. Thank you. Sincerely, very much. Thank you, man. Really nice. I appreciate you being so straightforward and so open and, uh, it, you're a very, I, I'm going to just say this again. You're a very nice guy. You've been so kind to me. You were very, um, I like, I, I only learned in the last 10 years the difference between kindness and weakness. And I'm very much attracted to kindness because that's one of those things like I was telling you about, man, stop being an asshole. You stop being so stressful. Life is easier. And then you start meeting other people that are nice too. And isn't that amazing? And you're one of those guys. So thank you very much, man. I appreciate it. I don't take stuff yeah, like that for, uh, for it, granted. It was my pleasure. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social social media channels with your buddies. Uh, go to rickemmett.com. Again, it's R-I-K-E-M-M-E-T-T.com. Check out all the cool new stuff he's got going on there. Uh, follow him or find him on Facebook and Twitter. Download the Bonfire Sessions or at least the first six-pack. He's going to have a bunch of them. Sign up to his forum. Ask him the meaning of life and he will tell you, I promise. Uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Don't forget that. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Rick, thank you for everything, brother. You're welcome.